the human and the natural world are going into the future as a single sacred community or we will both perish in the desert. Now, uh, but there's this as regards uh, priorities. Um, it's not easy in practical affairs to establish uh, priorities in any adequate way. But there was a study in uh, 19, uh, 1980 where over 700 scientists from over 100 different nations, most of them third world nations, got together to discuss this issue. And they came up with a, a, uh, a document called Strategy for, Conser uh, for Strategy for Conservation and Development, in which they said quite plainly that the future of third world countries lay precisely in their capacity to deal, to save their ecology. And so the ecosystem, the basic ecosystems, are the primary context. Uh, there is this about, uh, say, this country even. We are losing, or at least in the States, we are losing between four and six billion tons of topsoil every single year. Now, if we continue to do that, then there's no possibility of feeding people because there's not going to be the soil to grow the food. Already, it's estimated that by the end of the century, if that were to continue, we would barely be able to support ourselves in the States, much less supply the rest of the world. Meanwhile, the option for the poor, in the way it's functioning at the present time, it's one of the greatest obstacles to getting on with the environmental issue. We have statements from the, uh, from the Vatican, from the floor to the ceiling, on the, on the economic issue, on the option for the poor. We don't have anything on, on the natural world, on saving the environment. We don't have a single a significant document. Well, we do have one, perhaps the Philippines bishops have put out um, a document called What is Happening to Our Beautiful Land? It was something that was written by Sean McDonough, and uh, we had worked together on some of this. What did they do to it before they approved it? They took out one of the important paragraphs on population. They destroyed an a, a important aspect of the encyclical by being unwilling to deal with population. And population is one of the most disastrous things that's happening to the planet. We're trying to be good to people, but we are in a certain sense being enormously cruel under the guise of goodness. We, under the guise of saving people, we're destroying people. The Philippines, that began this century with six million people, have doubled every 20 years, from six to 12 to 24 to 50, 70 million now. And that's in the process of doubling. There'll be over 100 million people, at least by the year 2010. Meanwhile, the mangrove swamps are destroyed, the coral leaves, reefs, which are one of the richest ecosystems on the planet, are 80% severely damaged. The, uh, a third of the soil is severely damaged, two thirds is partly damaged, and the uh, rainforest that once covered over 90% of the area, it will be almost totally gone. Only 10% survives now. So you could list disaster to disaster too, the natural environment ostensibly to take care of people. Why do they blast the, the fisheries? To take care of people. Why do they destroy the mangrove swamps? To take care of people. And where is it all going to end up? In total collapse of a fantastic number of people. So uh, this plea of taking care of people is leading to an enormous amount of catastrophe. Now, uh, this leads to 
something else, uh, to a number of other things. We are brought into the being by the planet, by the natural world, on its conditions, not our conditions. And we have evolved a pathology that leads us to believe that we can uh, can um, change these conditions in their ba most basic form. And that is, and a large part of this catastrophe is rooted in biblical Christian tradition. Didn't happen in the Buddhist world, didn't happen in the Hindu world, didn't happen in the Chinese world. They were not totally benign with their environment, but this assault on the environment, this devastation of the environment, has arisen out of what? It's risen out of the millennial vision at the end of uh, St. John's uh, book of Revelation, that there would come a time when the uh, dragon would be chained for a thousand years and there would be peace, justice, and abundance under the reign of the saints. And this vision has driven Western civilization and it's made us radically unhappy with our human condition. So radically unhappy that I describe this sometimes that in the Western psyche, there's a deep hidden rage against the human condition. We're the only people that have that. Why? In the Christian tradition, we have learn that there is a possibility and a guaranteed by divine promise of a, uh, of a situation where humans would be transcendent to what we call the human condition. Now, other peoples deal with the human condition mainly by strengthening their inner capacity to deal with this. That's why you see peoples that we just marvel. How do they live? Why are they so happy? and uh, amid such difficulties of life is because they've developed interiorly a way of dealing with life creatively from within the structure of their own inner development. What do we do? Well, we decide uh, that we don't like to strength within. We want to control without. We want to change. Uh, in summer, we want air conditioning. In winter, we want heat. We don't want to experience heat. We don't want to experience cold and travel. We don't want the difficulty of walking. We want to float along on, on, uh, on power, on artificial power. We don't want to walk upstairs. We want power. And it looks so, uh, so attractive. And once we start on that, we begin to build this whole artificial world. And pretty soon we can't do without it. Now, coming back to people, it is, it is the question of, of some very, very um, difficult balances and of understanding history and culture and understanding just why the poor are suffering as they are and why all our efforts to release them from that only seem to make it deeper. Thank you.